بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So I wanna um, begin by stating that this is a very um, sensitive topic and I'm fully aware of its sensitivity um, and uh, the issue of whether Muslims should visit Aqsa or not there's two um, things to discuss the first is a fiqhi or legal issue and the second is the emotional issue now with regards to the first the fiqhi issue inshallah we can all discuss and i will discuss it with regards to the second the emotional issue i don't feel qualified to make any judgment because that is a very subjective and a very personal position it's not something you can argue with anybody if their emotions are in a particular inclination they have the right to feel that way and we have really cannot say anything about this and i begin this because i know many of our brothers and sisters from that region are not pleased with the fact that some of us are going and visiting. And I myself have been very strongly rebuked by some of our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and others support it. And I do not wish to get involved in the emotional argument. I can only pretend to understand. I can only say that I see where you're coming from. When somebody says to me that that is our land, we can't even go there. And what right do you have to go visit under occupation? Would you like it if somebody stole your house and then people are going to see your house and you cannot go see it? Somebody asked me this point blank and I could not say anything in response because this is a emotional issue and it is an emotional argument. And you cannot argue with an emotional argument. The person who feels this way, I want to be very clear, has every right to feel that way. And I have no right to diminish from that person's anger and that person's frustration against me or against anybody who chooses to visit. Therefore, I do not even attempt to, to argue because there is no argument. It's a valid point. It's a valid perspective. And I understand that perspective. So I'm not going to argue that issue of the emotional issue of should I or should I not visit. That's a valid perspective. What I can argue is from the fiqhi or legal issue and then say from the emotional issue that my dear brother who feels this way please understand that there are millions of other Palestinians who also live in that land and who feel differently than you do I as a non-Palestinian cannot get involved in the emotional issue it's not my right it's not my perspective to do that but to those people who feel very strongly against at least acknowledge that amongst your own people who have the same attachment to the land, there are the opposite sentiment as well. That's all that I ask for the emotional. As for the fiqh issue, this is something that inshallah we can all discuss academically, we can argue, we can debate. Understand my dear brothers and sisters that from a legal perspective, from a fiqh perspective in our times, there are obviously, as you can expect, two opinions on the issue. There's hardly anything except that we hear there are two opinions on the issue. And there are many, many ulama who have given fatawa on the issue of visiting Palestine. One group of them say that it is legally speaking haram to visit. Forget the emotional, this is now legal. They say it is not allowed for Muslims to visit Palestine. And another group says that it is allowed for Muslims to visit Palestine. Now, what are the evidences of both sides? Very briefly, and again, this is a very detailed discussion. Just FYI, by the way, as well, I was uh, at the American Muslim Jurist Association, AMJA, this is last year, which is the largest group of ulama who come together in, annually in America. And in their last year's meeting, this issue was discussed. And I don't want to tell you this, but it's the fact, shouting matches erupted amongst the ulama. Shouting matches. Because one alim said it is allowed to visit. And another was very angry at this and stood up and thus began you know, in a gathering of knowledge, which should not have taken place, it was a bit of an embarrassment, but the emotions were so much, and understandably so. Like literally, these are all people, some of them, many of them PhDs, Azhar or Medina or whatnot, these are ulama, but the emo I, can under I can only say I understand. It's not my right to say I understand, but I can only pretend to understand that it, it touched such a raw nerve that when one of the ulama said it is permitted to visit Aqsa with these conditions, and many agreed with him, in the gathering, 
somebody stood up and began shouting and screaming and saying this is not allowed and this is helping Zionism and this and that and it was a back and forth and the people had to be calmed down this is in a gathering of ulama what then do you think of people you know who they're not supposed to have that yani, their ilmi background still is going to get even more emotional nonetheless let me state that let's try to keep emotions out of this and speak it from a legal perspective the main issue that the fuqaha who say that it is haram to visit Al-Aqsa right now, they say Muslims visiting Al-Aqsa is a tacit approval of the occupation. This is the main argument that is given. Okay, In order for us to get to Aqsa, even if our visa is not stamped, we are given a visa. The issuing authority that gives us that visa in the eyes of many people, is an occupying authority. You understand what I'm saying here? What right do they have to give us a visa? The fact that we take the visa, even if it's not stamped in our passports, it is there, we have it. It's in our passports physically, even if it's not stamped. This is, in Arabic, iqrar. It is a tacit approval that you have accepted status quo. You have acquiesced and agreed that the occupier has occupied and has now given you permission to visit. This is the first point they say. And this is the main point that, that they bring it up. Then they say that you visiting as well will show the world that the perception they want to give is that we allow Muslims to pray there. The occupier wants to say this. But the reality is the majority of Muslims cannot pray there. And in fact, the local Palestinian peoples themselves cannot pray there except after meeting a long list of conditions, which is why the daily salawat are empty. And sadly, at any given salah, there are probably just as many foreigners as there are local Palestini. Can you imagine in any masjid in America, if the majority of people praying were not Americans, they were foreigners, something would be wrong. Like, what is this? Is it an American masjid or what? In Palestine, in Masjid al-Aqsa, perhaps 50%, if not more, or a little bit less, are foreigners. You go around, you have people from Malaysia, people from America, people from uh, South Africa, people from uh, England, from Canada. These are the Muslims coming and praying because they have the visas. Obviously, by the way, many of you should, I mean, all of you should know this, the majority of Muslim countries do not allow their citizens to go and pray there. Aslan, they don't allow them. So if you're from Pakistan, okay, if you're from any Arab country, Khalij or whatnot, Aslan, you cannot go anyway. Your country is not going to, the, 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 there is no diplomatic relation. So which Muslims can go? Small segments of the Muslim world, primarily from the Western world, which is like us. We are the Muslims, the American Muslims, the Canadian Muslims, the British Muslims, South African Muslims, uh, Mauritius, we saw a group from Mauritius this year as well. Um, where else do we see Muslims from? Hmm? Portugal. Portugal as well, Australia, we had Australia. So these are the types of Muslims that come. Okay. Now, you do the math, what percentage of the Ummah is that? So, the claim is, by you going there, it will become a Kodak moment for the occupying authorities. Look, we're free. Look, we allow people to come and pray. So you will be helping the occupiers in a spiritual sense, in a PR sense. Is that clear? Okay. And then they say that you will be helping the occupier in a financial sense. How so? Because you're going to go there and do what? Spend money. And when you spend money, then the economy will be boosted. Okay, so these are the three main reasons that are given when they say that it is not allowed to visit Aqsa. And there are many councils around the world and many famous ulama who have given this position. And they say that until Al-Aqsa is liberated, Muslims should not visit as principle. Jayid, I respect that position from a legal perspective. I'm not speaking about the emotional at all. From a legal perspective, it's a valid fatwa. With my utmost respect, I strongly, vehemently disagree. And I'm not the only one. Alhamdulillah, there are many ulama across the globe who have given the fatwa that it is allowed to visit with some conditions. And they have some very, very strong evidences that clearly demonstrate that it is allowed. The first evidence 
is that Al-Aqsa is not like any other land. It is intrinsically holy regardless of who controls it politically or not. You cannot make qiyas upon your house or my house that has been confiscated. Because this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has been made blessed regardless of who controls the keys to go in and out. This is a unique situation and scenario that Al-Aqsa remains blessed. And we all agree it remains blessed regardless of the political people or the entity in charge of Al-Aqsa. So it shall remain blessed. And if we as Muslims can get that barakah, and here we get to all the Quran and all the hadith about the praise of barakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Al-Aqsa the uh, Ard al-Muqaddas. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says that this is the Ard barakna fiha and barakna hawlaha. Like there are so many adjectives. We have blessed it. We have blessed around it. It is the blessed land. It is the holy land. And our Prophet Sallallahu explicitly said that there are only three places you should visit and the third is Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he said this when Masjid Al-Aqsa was under Roman pagan control. It was under Roman control. And he said this at that point in time, it should be visited. It wasn't under Muslim control when the hadith was said. So this is the first point, that Al-Aqsa is blessed regardless of who is in charge. And it is incorrect to make a qiyas or an analogy, if your house were stolen, then you're not allowed to go. Would you like if your friend goes? It's not your house or my house. It is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And regardless of who has political control, it shall remain blessed. And we will get barakah and blessings to go there. The first point. The second point, from a fiqhi and seerah perspective, it is incorrect to say that visiting an occupied land is tacit support of the occupier. This is incorrect from the seerah. And we can prove this from multiple incidents. The most significant is Hudaybiyyah and the next year Umratul Qada. Okay? Hudaybiyyah and Umratul Qada. Hudaybiyyah. Took place in which year? Seerah guys, everybody should know. Come on. In this masjid, you guys studied the seerah. Which year? Sixth. Eighth is the conquest of Mecca. Sixth year of hijrah. Hudaybiyah took place. In the sixth year of the hijrah, who had the political control of Mecca? The Quraysh. What had the Quraysh done? What had they not done against the Muslims? The list of atrocities against the Muslims go on and on and on and on. In fact, and here is a very, very key point. Mecca, at that point in time, was a center, a'udhu billah, of idolatry. The haram was the center of idolatry. We don't like to think about that. How many idols were around the Kaaba, guys? 360. Now, we don't like to think about that. We, don't, we just want to just gloss over and read. But I really ask you now to visualize, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, to visualize in your mind, doing tawaf and seeing symbols of paganism everywhere. Seeing false gods worship besides Allah. You would have seen Allah and Al-Uzza, at least their representatives because the original Lat is elsewhere, but still they had the photocopy, they had their mini icons as well, right? Uzza, uh, Hubal was over there in front of the Kaaba, was the main idol in front of the Kaaba was Hubal. Allah was of course in Ta'if and Uzza was other, but the point is they had the 360 gods. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say, oh, Mecca is under enemy control. Oh, there are 360 false gods there. If we do tawaf, this is tacit approval, a'udhu billah, of those gods. At least in Al-Aqsa, in the Muslim part of it, alhamdulillah, there's nothing but Islam. There's no symbol of kufr over there. There's no cross, there's no nothing there that is against our religion. Even if there were, by the way, it would be halal to go, based on this, this issue. Even if there were, why? Because the Kaaba is blessed regardless of what the Quraysh do or don't do. The Kaaba is sacred, independent of what the Meccans and the Quraysh do. If there's filth around the Kaaba, the Kaaba remains pure and tahir. The Najjas does not affect the tahara of the Kaaba and the sanctity and the blessedness of the Kaaba. So the same applies to Al Aqsa as well. In fact, Al Aqsa, there is no, as I said, icon of kufr within the Muslim complex. So the Prophet ﷺ went to 
Mecca wanting to perform the Umrah. As you know, Hudaybiyah took place. They told him to go back and come back the next year. He did come back the next year. And Umrah al-Qadha took place in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And in the seventh year, the Prophet wasallam and the Muslims, 1,400 of them, they entered the Haram and they performed the Tawaf and the Sa'i even as the idols were around. Even as the Quraysh controlled Mecca. They had to negotiate a treaty. This was the equivalent of the visa. This is exactly what a visa is. It's a license to enter. And the treaty of Hudaybiyah was a visa. And the visa was valid from the next year. That's exactly what it is. So with my utmost respect to any alim who says that going to that land endorses that land. No, the Prophet ﷺ did not endorse the legitimacy of the status quo of Mecca. But it is a practical reality. You have to go to the Haram to perform your Tawaf and Sa'i. What are you going to do if the Quraysh and the, and the pagans are in charge? You have to go. The whoever is in charge does not affect the sanctity of the haram. And if you have to negotiate your treaty or your visa to get in, so be it. You don't agree with the legitimacy. This is simply the formalities to enter the haram. And that's exactly what our Prophet ﷺ did. And in fact, in the seerah as well, we learn of another incident in which somebody can say, oh, but this is the Prophet ﷺ. We say, firstly, the Prophet ﷺ is a qudwa, is a role model for us in everything, unless an exception comes otherwise. Secondly, he explicitly allowed and commanded another new convert to go perform when other Muslims were banned from doing so. Remember, the treaty uh, prohibited the Muslims of Medina from coming, except for that one interim in Umrat al-Qadha. Otherwise, they couldn't come. Okay, look at the seerah. In the seventh year of the Hijrah, one of the chieftains of Najd, and Najd was not under Muslim rule or Meccan rule, it was independent. Najd was independent. One of the chieftains of the Najd, Thumama ibn Athal, he was captured in a raid, and he was a pagan, a mushrik, he did not believe in Islam. And he was an enemy of Allah and His Messenger at that time. And I mentioned this story in a lot of detail in our Sira lectures, which of course all of you have memorized and taken good notes of. So, he was brought to the Haram, the, not the Haram, the Prophet Masjid. He was brought to Medina, to Mama ibn Athal. And the story is very famous, that the Prophet said, What do you think, O Thumama? What do you think? What, should, what do you think we should do? So, Thumama said that, Ya Muhammad, of course he's not a Muslim, that uh, if you free, then you're going to free somebody who knows the meaning of generosity. And if you want money, then ask as you please and I will give you. And if you kill, then you kill somebody whose blood is heavy. I mean, he spoke like a leader. Spoke like a leader. And he was the leader of the tribe of, of the Najd. He was a, a very famous, very powerful leader, right? If you forgive, you forgive somebody who's going to be generous back to you. If you want money, I will give you what you want. And if you want to kill me, well, you go ahead and kill me. But you're going to kill somebody whose blood is very heavy. You're going to kill somebody, you're going to get into a lot of political issues. So the Prophet said, keep him the masjid for three days. So he was tied to the masjid, fed, taken care of. But he was basically, there was no prison. So the masjid became a prison for him. For three days he observed the Muslims. I'm going into my seerah lecture here, but very briefly. For three days he observed the Muslims. And the Prophet every day would ask the same question. Every day he would ask the same question. After Fajr al he would call him, say, what do you think? And the same three. Ya Muhammad, if you do this, this, if you do this, this, if you do this, this, then it put him back in. So tie him to the, to the you know, things will be tied up gently, not any, there's no torture, it's just uh, kept from fleeing. Then on the third day, the same thing he said. So the Prophet said, let him go. Khalas, he's not going to convert, subhanAllah. He did not force him to convert, he did not threaten him, he did not ask for a ransom. He said, khalas, let him go. Right then and there, Thumama went performed ghusl, he had already learned how to do all of this because he's in the masjid three days and he came back and in front of everybody he said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka la rasulullah wallahi ya rasulullah from Muhammad this which is to rasulullah wallahi ya rasulullah la in kunta anta abghadu an-nas ila used to be the most despised person to me but now you are the most beloved person to me and he goes on the beautiful story i mentioned in the sira then he said ya rasulullah you caught me and i was intending to do the umrah he has not entered ihram yet okay ihram is going to take place where Abiyar Ali, Miqat, right? 
Dhul Hulayfa. He's not in ihram right now. He could have gone back. He said, Ya Rasulullah, your people caught me and I was intending to do Umrah. Okay, what season is this? The boycott season. What era is this? The Quraysh are in charge. Should I go and do Umrah or now go back now that I'm a Muslim? Explicit scenario here. And the Prophet said, go. Because he was not obliged by the treaty. And with my utmost respect to the other groups who say haram, we are like Thumama ibn Uthal. Our country, America, which is our citizenship, or Canada, Australia, is not under the treaties that other Muslim countries have. I understand a person from Pakistan, from Saudi Arabia, okay, I understand, there's no question, your countries don't have the, 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 the issues are there, khalas, okay, don't go. No problem, that's what there is no, but for us, we don't have those treaties. We are Thumama ibn Uthal. We have that, that neutrality that we can go because Thumama was allowed to go. So when Thumama came, by the way, they realized something is wrong. Something is not right here. You're not the same Thumama. So they asked him that, uh, sabauta have you, yani saba, as they said, they would, make, they, would, they would use the term Saba to say Islam, that have you converted to that faith? And when they found out that he did, they manhandled him, they surrounded him, they raised their voices, and he said, Wallahi, because of this, not a single grain that my people would send to you of wheat or barley is going to reach you ever. And he went back angry and he boycotted the people of Quraysh. This is the, you can call the BDS movement here if you want to get a little bit. So he said, we're not going to economically support you guys until the people of Quraysh had to beg the Prophet to write a letter to Thumama to allow the wheat to come back in. They said, please, we are your relatives. We need the food. You know, remember us that when they needed him, they called the Prophet Point being, Thumama was allowed to perform Umrah despite the fact the Muslims of Medina could not perform Umrah. And despite the fact that Mecca was under occupation of the Quraysh and it was ruled by pagans but the sanctity of Mecca still remained so I say to those ulama not me but other ulama as well we say that look emotions aside visiting Al-Aqsa does not mean we endorse the occupation not at all because if that were the case then somebody better than us visited a land that was worse occupied than what this is because of the filth of the idols that does not at all endorse. It simply is the logistics of getting there and the acknowledgement that, okay, these are the people in charge. Doesn't mean we agree that they're in charge. There's a difference between acknowledging versus legitimizing. And acknowledging is not the same as legitimizing. طيب. As for the third point, which is that you going there will help the uh, occupiers economically or PR-wise or whatnot, we say, and especially I say to anybody who says this, and I say this without trying to be mean or nasty, you speak on ignorance and without knowledge. You have not visited like all of us have visited. You have not spoken to the people. Don't bring in emotions. Bring in hard and cold facts. And I have gone, Brother Abdi and others have gone multiple times, speak to those that are going regularly. I swear to you, not a single Palestinian that we have met in those lands, and we have met hundreds and thousands, except that they were happy and pleased to see us. The Palestinians who don't want us to go are those who themselves cannot go, and I understand. That's all I can say. I have nothing more to say to them. I understand. You have been exiled, and it's painful for you. I have no right to say anything to you. You have every right to feel that anger and rage, and some of it is directed towards me because I get to go to the land that is yours, and you're not allowed to go. I can only say that I understand. That's all I can do. It's not an argument. But don't say that this is the unanimous position of all Palestinian people. On the contrary, those Palestinians that are under the occupied lands, in the occupied lands, those Palestinians that are living there, go speak to them. I swear to you, the first year that I went, I was, uh, the, uh, uh, for I, I had not gone for many years because I felt maybe it's going to be difficult for me to go see the negatives, whatnot. The first year that I went, the Palestinians, when they hugged us, they cried, they gave us this, they said, and we had a guide with us, 
Uh, this year he was not in our group, but we had a guide. He lived in New York for 15 years or so. He came back fluent English and whatnot, and he recorded a video, and I put it on my Facebook. He recorded a video, and he said, Oh Muslims of America, if you're going to abandon us, who's going to then you know, come and support us in this world? If you're not going to come and you have American citizenship, then who else is going to come? If you're not going to stay at our hotels, if you're not going to go to our tourist agencies, pause here, realize that land, it is worse in its sectarianism than the 1960s America was. Because sectarianism there is not based on skin color, it's based on religion. And everything is depending on your religion. If you're Muslim, if you're this, if you're that, everything. Where you stay, where you eat, who you associate with, all of it is based on your religion. That's why when you enter the Aqsa complex, they will look at you and make an assessment. If you're brown skin bearded, you can go. If you don't look Arabesque or Islamesque or whatever, they will stop you and they will ask you, are you Muslim? And they will quiz you. We had converts. They were quizzed. If you're Muslim, recite Surah Fatiha. These are the Israeli guards. Recite Surah Fatiha. If you're Muslim or not. Okay. And in one case, I know what one person. He's like, recite a Surah from the Quran. So the guy recited Ikhlas. The Israeli guard, the idea of... Said, Everybody knows Ikhlas. Recite another Surah. <laughs> so he recited Fatiha. said, okay, you can go. Fatiha is okay. <laughs> okay. It's like, what are you going to do? Point is that everything is based on, on your religion there. So our Palestinian brothers and sisters who own establishments, restaurants, travel agencies, hotels, they do not get business from the majority of clientele from the people who visit. You understand what I mean here? Okay? They do not get business. So the claim that we going there supports the occupiers I'm sorry you're speaking out of ignorance. You don't know the reality. And this is a theoretical issue that you feel you have not been there to see. We make it a point, and I have met dozens of groups from England, Canada, uh, um, South, South Africa, uh, Mauritius. They all come and they make it a point. Everyone, I don't know of a single group of the Muslims, well, other than the ones that the MLI type of folks or whatever, not, not the real people that Muslims that go, uh, but by this I mean the practicing people that go. I don't know of a single group of Muslims that goes that stays at the hotels of people other than the Palestinians. Every Muslim group that goes makes it a point. Now, by the way, this means we have to sacrifice because the best hotels are not owned by the Palestinians. You understand? The best companies are not owned by the Palestinians. Our hotel is a two and a half star hotel, if even that. And I tell the people, look, in Mecca, we're in the five stars. In Medina, we're in the five stars. I say, look, we are not going to stay in the five stars. Because do you know what it means to stay in the five stars of Jerusalem? Do you know what it means? This would mean supporting for no reason. And there's no reason to do that. So every Muslim group that goes, without exception, they make it a point that they're going to employ Palestinian uh, travel agencies, people that need the, the economic boost that we can bring them, and as well, the, the, the PR that they're talking about, quite the contrary, this perception that we will benefit the PR of the occupiers, nothing could be further from the truth. Us abandoning Al-Aqsa is beneficial for the PR. Why? We were told this by the locals. Ask anybody who went with our group, the previous years as well. The local Palestinians said that one of the things that is now being said is that Muslims don't care about Aqsa because it's empty, because it's abandoned. So many Muslims can come, but they're not coming. And you know that that piece of land is the most highly contested piece of land in human history. There, it is the most prime religious real estate in the world. The holiest Religious sites of Christianity and Judaism and Islam are within stone's throw of each other. So, if you go to the Jewish side, packed. Packed. You go to the Christian side, packed. You go to the Muslim side, dead empty. When I say dead empty, I mean dead empty. Ask anybody here. The five daily salawat. Masjid al-Aqsa is a massive complex 
massive complexes, not just one masjid. Within it are small masajid, at least 20 or 30. Uh, the, the largest of them is Masjid Al-Qibali and Masjid, the Dome of the Rock, right? So Masjid Al-Aqsa, you should all know, is a big complex. It's a large area. It's not just one mosque. It's a large area. And perhaps up to half a million people can pray easily in the complex. The complex, not the, the masjid itself, right? When I, so <laughs> don't get confused here. The, the complex is a flat area of land. And within it, you have the Dome of the Rock, and you have the Masjid Al-Qibali, and you have other small masajid. It's a massive area of land. The whole area is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, technically. That whole area is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And that area, if everybody were to be praying there as people used to once upon a time, you could get maybe half a million people. It's like the Haram of Mecca, that big. A little bit smaller than that, but that, but in that area, you walk in, and I have a video on my Facebook, look it up from last week, okay? And I prayed Fajr, and I walked out, and it was absolutely dead empty. Three saf. Yani, we get three saf at MIC here in Memphis. Do you think Masjid al-Aqsa deserves three sufuf for a fard salah? We had just come from Makkah and Medina in our group. Uh, we do the three city tour and Mecca and Medina were so packed that if you leave a few minutes before the Adhan even then you will pray outside in the in the Sahal in the in the uh, you know outside complex you wouldn't be able to get inside now we're a bit irritated of so crowd but at the same time alhamdulillah it's a sign of Islam that Mecca and Medina is packed alhamdulillah Muslims from around the world are praying there now the contrast straight from that packed to capacity, then you go and you go to the third holiest and it is absolutely empty. What does that show? So, the position that I respectfully follow from a fiqhi perspective is that it is fard kifaya for the Muslims of the West to visit Al-Aqsa. Fard kifaya. We have to demonstrate to the occupied authorities that this is our land. It is our masjid. It is our symbol. And it doesn't matter who controls it. We are going to come and pray there. And we have to demonstrate that this place will not be abandoned. And Allah has blessed us or tested us with a nationality that allows us to do that. For those nationalities that don't, we understand. Khalas, you have that treaty that cannot do it. We understand. Nothing to do. So from a fiqhi perspective, any evidence that is raised to say that it is haram with my utmost respect is extremely weak. And I don't say this, you know, lightly. Wallahi, it is very weak from a fiqhi perspective. The emotional perspective, I fully understand and I'm quiet about. No, that's not, I can debate. That's a valid perspective. And I can only say to my Palestinian brothers who feel this way that you need to get angry at the other Palestinians, not at me. How I'm not going to get involved between this issue. I understand to the best of my ability, but it's not my position to take a side for or against in this issue. Uh, one final point that will open the floor for some question and discussion. And inshallah in my next, next khutbah, I will mention this um, in more detail uh, because it's some amazing stories. This was the first time in my uh, three time visits that I actually met uh, Israeli converts to Islam. And this was the most bizarre set of converts I have ever met in my life. And I have met, alhamdulillah, many. I just could not believe their stories. And I will share with you in more detail, inshallah, in the next khutbah that I give at MRC. I will share with you some of them because they are very, very emotional um, stories. Truly mind-boggling how groups of people living on the other side and never interacting with Muslims, every one of these converts discovered Islam on his or her own. Because you don't give da'wah in that land. There's no pamphlets being distributed, you know, that people are going to come and, and do. Every one of them discovered Islam on his or her own. And they had to go out of their way to find a Muslim. Many of them had to leave their physical places, their parents or their siblings or whatnot, Many of them went incognito. They had to cut off everything. And it's just a very interesting demographics. And I was told that perhaps up to a thousand 
have actually converted, but the majority of them are underground. They're anonymous because they are stuck between two sides, both of whom don't want them. And that was the most painful to me. We understand why the original side does not want them. And as for the other side, they're always viewed as potential spies. And this was the issue that they faced, that this was a very difficult issue, that conversion in that land is not just religion. You are changing sides. Like one of them said to me, when you convert, your family and friends think you have chosen the enemy over them. It's not just a different religion, a different rituals, and different qibla. When you convert, you are a traitor. So you're cut off from that. Then the other Muslim side is like, whoa, hold on a sec. We don't know what to make of you. Are you this? Are you that? And so it is something that, uh, you know, subhanAllah, uh, it's something that very, very um, painful. Uh, I have to mention, subhanAllah, I'm just getting a text message. <laughs> One of the converts is actually listening online to me right now, live. Uh, I will mention her story, inshallah ta'ala, later on. She just messaged me now, uh, and I gave her the name Aisha. Uh, her name was something else. I cannot mention her name because uh, it would not be, she did not want to be mentioned. She just texted me now that she's going to be watching. Uh, I'll mention her story briefly, inshallah. So this is a sister. Uh, she had emailed uh, uh, my account, uh, my public account. I don't check messages that often, but I just checked this one. And uh, she had mentioned that she's an Israeli Jew interested in Islam. Now, when somebody emails you like that, I don't answer most of my emails, you know what I mean? So I'm just telling you. But when somebody emails you like that, you can't not go back and forth. So back and forth, back and forth. And so, subhanAllah, it was many months ago. I said, okay, I'm coming in January. Let's, uh, you know, meet up and hear your story directly. Uh, she's from uh, Western land. She left that Western land uh, to perform what is called Aliyah, which is Hijra. Okay, so the Jews perform Aliyah, which is Hijra. They leave the Western land and they go to settle religiously in Israel as an act of God. And she stayed there for 15 years or so until she became disillusioned with the faith of Judaism. And she became agnostic. But there's an emptiness in her life, religiously. So she begins reading Everything, Buddhism, Christianity, obviously the last on the list is going to be what? As always, the last on the list, okay? And then she starts reading the Quran, and she said that I was taught that the Quran is a book of violence and hatred. I was taught that the Quran tells people to kill the Jews. And that was the only perspective that we had. And when I read it, I began to see its peace. And I really started falling in love with the Qur'an. Then she logged online, started listening to lectures, and then she came across yours truly online. Then she emailed me that I listened to your lectures, mashallah, at this very place, mashallah, listened to your lectures, and subhanAllah, you know what lecture moved her the most, subhanAllah? Khadija radiallahu anha. Listening to the story of Khadija. Okay, so, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, uh, she converted in Masjid al-Aqsa. I gave the shahada to her in Masjid al-Aqsa, in front of the group you were, you were there. Uh, we, we were all there at that time. So she actually converted and said the shahada in Masjid al-Aqsa. And uh, we, we gave her a ceremony and he, privately, which we cannot mention her name or pictures or anything because obviously it is something that uh, it would cause great difficulty. find out or else it would be problematic. Now in her case it might not be physically problematic, it could be emotionally but in other converts that I met the next day, so I met with her and then I met with another group of converts as well. SubhanAllah, some of them, they are worried for their safety and they are living in believe it or not, I mean, wallahi, this is as if I went back to the time of the seerah. They're living in like Darul Arqam type of houses. There are Palestinians there, they have with great danger to themselves volunteered their houses to be safe houses. I mean, wallahi, I literally felt as if I'm in the time of the, the seerah of the process now hearing their stories. There are houses that are now taking in these Jewish converts. 
And there's no monetary gain. There's nothing. What are you going to spy on these Bedouin Muslims or these? There's nothing. There's no spying going on here. These aren't like, you know, political entities. These are very low level. You know, you find a Muslim family, you live with them. And we met some of these people and subhanAllah, it was a very, for me, it was some of the most amazing stories I have heard of conversion in my life. And I'll mention some of them, inshallah, in the, the next khutbah that I'll give, which will be a little bit about this topic. So for me, this is yet another reason as well, why it's so important for us as, as Muslims to go to Masjid al-Aqsa and to see the reality of how our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and then also the other side as well, because the one who sees is not like the one who reads or hears. The one who experiences is not like the one who just hears about it from second-hand sources. So going there and seeing firsthand, it makes all of us feel a connection and we feel the importance, our iman goes higher, we see what is going on in that land and then we become passionate advocates. We become advocates based on knowledge. We come back and we can speak, I saw with my own eyes. I witnessed the disparity between this and that. I saw the oppression in this. So it comes a whole different level of the one who goes there. And how many of my Christian you know, brethren how many of my Christian friends, they went there and they came back completely converted on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 180 degrees. Some of the most passionate Christian advocates for the Palestinians, including the famous website, www. If Americans knew, I keep on telling you to log it out. She is a Christian lady, religious Christian, and she went there and then she converted over, not to Islam, but over the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Once you see it with your own eyes. So bottom line, fiqhi-wise, there is no strong argument to be made. With my utmost respect to the other side, it's more emotional. As for the emotional argument, I shrug my shoulders and I say, may Allah forgive us for irritating those brothers, but that's not our intention. Because it is, wallahi, it is understandable. That's not our intention, that they feel a type of betrayal. That's what they feel. They feel a type of betrayal. That how come you guys are going and we cannot go. And we have to, those of us who decide to go, we have to accept that anger. It's a legitimate anger. And we say, may Allah make it such that all of us can go, inshallah ta'ala, when situation changes. Uh, with that, any uh, questions or any uh, comments or whatnot, inshallah, bismillah. Yes, go ahead, yes. So the question is, do, do some of the um, legal verdicts that apply in Mecca and Medina apply in Quds? No. Quds, Masjid al-Aqsa, is not a haram. It is incorrect. You know, it's common to hear the, the word Thalith al-Haramain. Okay? Thalith al-Haramain, the third of the two harams, okay, is an oxymoron. Because how many harams are there? Haramain. Two. Aqsa is not a haram. Aqsa is Al-Ard Al-Muqaddas. Aqsa is a blessed land. It is a holy land. It is not a haram. Therefore, the legal prohibitions that apply to Mecca and Medina do not apply in Al-Aqsa. Okay. Other questions, issues, concerns, comments? Yes, we ate kunafa from, uh, what is it, Ja'far sweets? That, huh? Huh? Halwiyat Ja'far, yes, we ate kunafa from Halwiyat Ja'far directly, mashallah tabarakallah, and we had uh, shawarma as well from the other place, so yes, we went, um, uh, obviously that's one of the things you go and you do, all of the Palestinians, so you know, Aqsa is divided into quarters, you have the uh, Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, you have all these quarters there, and each of them is basically completely, the ambiance is completely, so when you're in the Muslim quarter, you're in the Muslim quarter, all Muslims, all Muslim shops, so obviously when you're there, yani mashallah, tabarakallah, the food, the people, everything, it's, uh, it's a very beautiful experience, alhamdulillah. Yes, we definitely had kunafa. Are you restricted to different areas uh, or not? So the response is, it depends on the guards. When you as a Muslim want to go to the Jewish side, you will be stopped again. You will be asked your identity, your, your visa, your passport. You will, be, you will be interrogated. You will be patted down, go through the machine. And seeing you as a Muslim, they will give you the special treatment. Then it's up to them should they allow you or not. We had in our group... Uh, a sister who wore the niqab 
when she was uh, a convert, white, uh, well, not she wasn't a convert, she was Caucasian, uh, and she looked Caucasian from her eyes and her passport name, everything there, and she was a niqabi, and she walked, wanted to go to the Wailing Wall. And they stopped her, interrogated her, gave her the quiz and whatnot, kept her for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then at the end they said, sorry, no. So she was not allowed to go. And the excuse they gave to her was, we cannot guarantee your safety. There are some crazy people over there. <laughs> this is what the Israeli guard said to her. We cannot guarantee your safety. We have some religious fanatics there. Okay. Uh, I have been uh, to the Wailing Wall. I, I confess. I know a lot of people will find that irritating. This year I did not go. But I have been just to see what was going on there. And um, they, they gave me the what's over. They, they ask you questions, what not. But in the end, it's up to them. They have the right to prevent you. And they have the right to let you through. Did you come across any crazy <laughs> there were people who stared at me very <laughs> harshly, intently. But uh, so when you get to the Wailing Wall, there are two zones. There is the public zone that you can see the Wailing Wall from like 30, 40 feet. Then that's one safety. You have to go through the security and whatnot. Then to get to the actual wall, there's yet a much more uh, intense security. And that's where the guards are standing completely lined up. To get to the outer rim, there's just four or five guards and a security post and interrogation. Okay, so you stand in line, like 20 minutes line, and they interview you one by one. If you look like whatever they let you go if you look like me or you they'll stop you so it's it's so it's very legal there to do a judgment call it's completely normal see it's very different in america if they did that you're like hey why are you doing that to me no in that land it is the norm if you look a certain way you're going to be treated differently and if you look a different way you're treated differently so depending exactly on how you look you will be assessed immediately on your looks if you look Arabic or Muslim or whatnot, khalas, you're going to get pulled aside right then and there. Even in the Tel Aviv airport, we forgot to mention some of us that our group, essentially one third of it, even though we walked up to the windows all separately, because there's many windows in the customs, right? One third of our group pulled aside and taken to the uh, special room for around 35 minutes. Okay, 35 minutes. Uh, Abdi was there, right? Yeah. MashaAllah. Me and Abdi were always together, MashaAllah. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't. You, you, he went through, yeah. MashaAllah. He's, I just got he's, in, <laughs> MashaAllah. He's, he's MashaAllah elderly. Yeah. So they, they yeah, let him through, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> MashaAllah. So we got for 35 minutes um, stopped, but we were like, when they kept on sending people, the guards didn't know there was an 80 group coming. They kept on sending all the Muslims in, right? Or whatnot. So MashaAllah, 35 people in a small room, all of us from Dar es Salaam group, from my group, all of us. So the guards looked at us. They know we're all one group together. Then they only stopped the Palestinians. Subhanallah. We had two sisters, both of them early 20s. Both of them like third generation. You know what I mean? They haven't been ever. And I don't know how, but they're, they figured out they're Palestinian. And those two sisters, five and a half hours. Your names, every one of your grandparents, every one of your eight grand great great parents, they have to know the names of this, by the way. They quiz you on everything. Your qabila, your tribe, where you were born, your grandfather born, this and that, everything. They give you the what's over. And we don't know whether they're going to make it, they're not going to make it. After five and a half hours, subhanAllah, they were allowed to go. Um, but we were genuinely worried because that's really the one group that they are the most antagonistic towards are obviously... Uh, people from Palestine. And, you know. agent said that uh, my computer is not working. Yeah, they yeah, give you. Excuse, yeah, they yeah. give you excuses and whatnot. I mean, they ask sometimes the most stupid questions. Last time we went, I mean, uh, one of the saddest <laughs> things, Allah, It's funny, but it's sad. Last year when we went, we had a Canadian convert. Uh, so he was the one Caucasian in the whole group. This is last year's group. I had a smaller group. This year I had 80. Last year I had. Was it 40 or so? So there was one, you know, complete blonde Caucasian with us. And he's like with our group. Uh, and so the agents pulled him to the rooms. Go, why are you with these guys? So he said, I'm a Muslim. It's like, why? Your name is Christopher, whatever. He goes, yeah, I converted to Islam. So this 19-year-old girl, the idea of, is like, because, you know, over there, you have to go through the two years training. Every single citizen 
has to go through two years of military training. So the people that are doing it are basically 19, 20, 21, that age group. So this girl is like interviewing him. It's like, why did you convert to Islam? Like she's demanding to know why you converted to Islam. So our brother says, because I found peace in Islam. You know what the lady said to her? Why couldn't you find peace in Buddhism? <laughs> like this is the interrogation officer. Okay. Why do you have to find peace in Islam? Couldn't you find it in Buddhism? So this is what you have to like, how do you answer that? Like, okay, I made the choice, you know. Another of our brothers last year, he was wearing a thobe when he went through this customs and his American passport. He was pulled aside. It's like, why are you wearing a thobe? Because it's comfortable. Yeah, but why a thobe? Because I want to wear a thobe. You were from New York, right? Yeah. Do you wear a thobe in New York? No, not all the time. Do you wear a thobe when you go to sleep? No, so why are you wearing it now? <laughs> it's like, it's just harassment. That's all it is, you know. They just want to irritate you. And if you lose your temper, halas, it's going to send you back. So we tell our group and every group, so it's like, look, you just have to keep your cool. Just stay calm. And this is just a fraction of what happens to the actual people. This is what a fraction. And subhanAllah, I have to say, we saw with our own eyes a very sad a case in front of us when one day we're walking back from dinner and uh, in uh, Al-Aqsa and we heard the screaming of a Palestinian lady, elderly lady, maybe 50, 60 years old and she was surrounded by guards and she kept on saying, why are you harassing me? Why are you doing? And I mean, astaghfirullah, but they were holding on to her, carrying her, what not and she's screaming out. One of our brothers wanted to intervene and I said, bro, if you go, this isn't America. If you walk towards those guards with submachine guns, this is not America. And I reminded him of the Prophet and Ammar ibn Yasir and Yasir and Sumayya. I said, we can't do anything here. His, there, there's a young brother with us, like young meaning in college, he's boiling. How can I not help? I was like, what are you going to do? You can walk there and khalas, we're not going to come back with you. End of story. Because they're surrounded and she, they, she was taken. Now later on the people said that she said something against the guards in her anger, and the guards then started surrounding her, and that shouting match went higher and higher, until finally she gets arrested and thrown away. So we see this with our own eyes. And yes, it's very painful, very painful. And I can understand those that say, how can you see that and go there? And that's a valid point. It's a valid point. But us not going there will not help the Palestinian lady as well. Us going there might help her relative that's running the shop, might help the Palestinians to see the Muslims come. Us boycotting it is not going to help her from getting arrested. It's all that I can say. It's a very difficult situation. We're trying to make the lesser of two evils, and Allah knows best. Any final points? Because Anything from the sisters, by the way, because the sisters are, always make sure they have their questions. Anything from the sisters going once, going twice. Memphian sisters don't really have usually... One final, point. Yeah. One final point, though. I want yes. Ammar to stand up for a second. Yes, Ammar, stand been up. Here. Yeah. Ammar was our leader, man. He, yeah. he helped us all along through our whole of the trip. <laughs> Come on, Ammar, stand up. Alhamdulillah. Like, 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 like. yes, yeah. uh, he really, I mean, uh, was a very, very big help, man. man Alhamdulillah. You. He, he, he went as a group leader this he year. He was in charge of the bus. Yes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. He went in the bus. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Eventually, we hope one day he'll give the khatras as well. That's the goal, inshallah. Okay. Checking the list off is good, but eventually he needs to do this. I mean, he, he did a great job. Alhamdulillah. 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 If ever somebody will request something, please request it. Yeah. 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 Ye
we are going in a group. And that's what we did every year. We have this whole group. So they understand, okay, this is a group coming here. So it kind of makes it a little bit easier for them to understand. Whereas if you're all by yourself, and especially if you're single or young, by single I don't mean not married, I mean coming singly, right? One person, generally speaking, who do they put aside in the room? It's people that are single or young. Generally, elderly or with families and children will let go. Generally speaking. So they want to just interrogate, hassle, you know, inconvenience you, and just see your response. And this was the first time we went through the airport uh, of Tel Aviv. Last year we have gone through the King Hussein Bridge out of Jordan. And um, there are pros and cons in each one, but I think overall landing in the airport was easier simply because the, the King Hussein Bridge, the, the dynamics of it are very different. Those of you that have gone from the King Hussein Bridge, you have to pass three borders, then the, the facilities are much worse, the interrogation is much more negative. If you land in Tel Aviv, it's like JFK. It's literally like JFK, like an airport. So they can't be that mean to you in public. Whereas in King Hussein Bridge, all Muslims and the Israeli guards. So it's a very different dynamics. Whereas in Tel Aviv airport, you're the only Muslim and there's 50 non-Muslims. You know, so like they can't be that rude to you publicly. Like it's a protocol that has to be followed. And so we found, in my experience is that landing at the airport seems to make it easier to, to get the, the group through. Less, uh, waiting time. less waiting time and less hassle. Even the interrogation was softer at the airport. But this is all anecdotal. You never know one year they can flip it around, make it worse. Inshallah. In any case, I don't want to delay Isha too much. Any final thing before we conclude? Aqsa complex, there's a one hour, is it 7.30 to 8.30? Or for one hour, Israelis and non-Muslims can enter. And they're under guard. So they come and they're protected by guards. You can see them, they don't interact with you. So there's one hour or two hours where they come in and they go around the complex, but they're with the guards. Okay, so they go in and out and they come out. Otherwise, no non-Muslim can enter the complex. Which is why the guards will ask you if they suspect are you Muslim or not? And the guards are Israeli. So there's two sets of guards. There's Israeli guards outside, Palestinian guards inside. So there's two sets of guards. So when you walk into the complex, firstly the Palestinians, the, Isra the, the, the Palestinians, by the way, don't have any weapons. The Israelis have the weapons. So the Israelis are going to assess you. They're worried about, especially a Jewish fundamentalist doing something crazy. So they want to make sure that no person comes for their PR. Okay? And then the Palestinian is obviously worried about the exact same thing from a different perspective. So the Palestinian is simply going to say, Assalamu alaikum. You say, Wa alaikum as salam, automatically he'll know, unless there's something very you know, off. So there's two sets of guards. It's the outer one that has the, the machines and the equipment if need be. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, the Palestinians don't have guns. The Palestinians do not have guns. They're just sitting there with, uh, in the booth. They don't have any weapons with them. Okay. Inshallah, with that we conclude. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, blesses each and every one of us to do deeds that are closest to Him. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our good deeds and forgives our evil deeds. We pray that Allah azza wa jalla blesses us to see the truth as truth and to act upon it and to see falsehood as falsehood and to abstain from it. Which is khairun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.